Cool. Okay. Hey, everybody. It's at Percussion Podcast. It is May 2nd, 2021, but you're probably listening on May 20th, 2021. My name is Casey Kangelosi, and I've got a, a pretty full house here. We'll start over there with Ksenia Komjanovic. Hey, Ksenia, how's it going? Hey, Casey, going well. How are you? Good. Hey, happy, like, weird European Easter in May. Oh, thanks, man. Thank you. That's totally not discriminatory against us Orthodox people. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, thank uh -huh. you. Thank you. Happy, happy Easter. <laughs> yeah, I spelled it the best I could there in our, little, our little chat. Good job. <laughs> also, we got Carly Vigna. How's it going, Carly? Hey, Casey. How's it going? Good, good, good. You in finals week? You in jury week? You done? What's going on? Done, actually. Done, done, done. I have some juries to grade tonight after we finish. They're due tomorrow, and then I'm done. I, had, I just, Then I just have high schoolers for another month or so. Probably yeah. when you say you have juries to grade, do they submit recordings? Is that? Yep. Okay. Yeah, we're doing, doing That's recordings what... again. That's what we're doing too. And I got to tell you, it is a lot easier than the, that one brutal day of uh, ours is usually nine to four or something like that. So yeah, just kind of watch them at your leisure. And I guess this year is kind of easy too. We had something like six senior and junior half recitals. So that's, that means juries is a lot, a lot lighter. Yeah. And um, Brian's here, Brian Nozny, Nozzle Todd. Hi. What's up, Brian? Hello, shalom. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you, buddy. And Ben Charles is here. Ben, let's hear uh, what happened today in history. Yeah, sure. So uh, this episode is being released on May 20th, and I found a few events that happened on May 20th in history. In 1846 was the American premiere of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, uh, which I had to like think about that for a second. The first performance was in Vienna in 1824. So this was 22 years after the premiere. Uh, it finally reached the States for a performance, which seems insane now that it's, it would take that long. Uh, in 1972, Ksenia's favorite artist, Busta Rhymes, was born. And in 1979, Elton John was the first ever Western pop star to tour the USSR. Uh, but the big item I wanted to talk about today was from 2000. And that is that uh, Lars Ulrich of Metallica was the first witness to testify at a U.S. Senate hearing over copyright law issues concerning sites like Napster and MP3.com, which would ultimately lead to iTunes and the digital music revolution. So for anyone that's not familiar, maybe some of our younger listeners, there was a, a service called Napster, and it was a file sharing service, and basically people would put albums on there or you know music on there and people would download it for free and it's actually interesting looking back on it with our, our viewpoints today it was actually sort of unclear to people if that was illegal or not and the thought was that if i get the new metallica album and i invite casey over to my house i can share it with him we can listen it to it together so what's the difference between me sharing the music from that album online for anyone to hear versus sharing it in person which obviously we know that now, but back then it's funny to me that that was a gray area at all. So basically what happened is Metallica discovered a demo of their song I Disappear was circulating online before it was released. And then to make things even worse, radio stations picked it up and started playing it. Uh, and then this alerted Metallica to the fact that their entire back catalog was online for free. So on March 13th, 2000, Metallica filed a lawsuit against Napster. A month later, Dr. Dre filed a similar lawsuit and they shared a litigator and legal firm. Uh, they sent a written request to Napster asking them to remove their songs from the service and Napster refused. Uh, and then also in March 2000, Madonna's single Music leaked on the web prior to its commercial release. So in 2000, there were several recording companies that sued Napster under the Recording Industry Association of Artists, RIAA for short, on the grounds that one, users were directly violating the plaintiff's copyrights, two, Napster was responsible for contributory infringement of the plaintiff's copyrights, and three, Napster was responsible for vicarious infringement of the plaintiff's copyrights. Napster lost the case in the district court, and then they lost their appeal in the, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, and they were told to bar access to copyrighted material on their service, which of course was impossible. So the service closed in July of 2001, 
Uh, in March of 2001, Napster settled both lawsuits after being shut down. Uh, I guess this was the uh, Metallica and Dr. Dre lawsuits versus the RIAA lawsuit. Uh, and in 2002, they announced bankruptcy and sold their assets to a third party. And interestingly, some people have argued that Napster actually helped promote music, including Radiohead, who had never appeared on the top 20, uh, but after tracks from Kid A were leaked, it debuted at the number one spot of the Billboard 200 sales chart when it came out. Uh, so it's really interesting, like I said, looking back with today's eyes, and we have things like Spotify and Apple Music and the iTunes Store uh, are definitely a descendant of this, and those are all obviously very legal means of music distribution, but it all started uh, in a, a dark, seedy, illegal virtual alley. I miss Nap. So wait, was for the kids at home? Is Napster before or after tapes? You know, uh, tapes. I guess after because Napster was around <laughs> 2000 and tapes are like the 90s. That was a joke, man. Yeah, oh, definitely sorry. after. Definitely. <laughs> well, after. I was thinking like you meant like sharing mixtapes. Yeah, we were talking about mixtapes in the chat, and um, yeah, but no, like it is. I mean, it all started with Brian saying, "Yeah, I feel so old," like having to explain what Napster was. But yeah, I mean that that time is like truly like come and gone, like. Um, yeah, file sharing. I know it still exists and everything, but it's uh, it's far it's far harder to to well, do now. One of one of the things that uh, Steve Jobs, among other people, realized were that people weren't necessarily interested in stealing music; they just wanted to get music in the most convenient way possible. So, if you could come up with a way to digitally distribute music that just cost a reasonable amount, mm. people would go for that, and that's like where the iTunes store came in. And I remember in 2005, when I went to college, I got my first ever iPod and it came with like, you know, those little like plastic sticky things that are always on electronics that you peel off and it's really satisfying. It came with one of those and it said on it, don't steal music. That's cool. I am old enough to remember using Napster. And one of the things for me was that I remember the big argument when all the Metallica stuff came down. Um, some artists were actually on the other side of it. I remember Chuck D from Public Enemy basically making the argument that, hey, Napster and things like this are a means by which great artists are going to be able to gain access to the mass populace and not have to go through the label connections and, and all of that stuff. And there's some bands, one of my favorite indie bands, this group called The Livid, that was this canadian just progressive rock band that i loved and i remember finding them on napster because they had a song and then in parentheses after it was like if you like tool incubus deftones blah 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 and like i was like i love i love all of those and i started downloading them and i, I went nuts and i absolutely loved this band so I stealing is wrong don't steal but at the same time it did help to push a lot of that breaking through, getting rid of the label system in a lot of ways. And I remember there being good stuff that came from Napster because of the fact that it got rid of the whole label system. Like mm -hmm. now you had access to the whole general populace, which now if you look at YouTube, I mean, you can put anything on YouTube and all the world can see it. So I think that that was kind of a precursor to it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it probably did a lot of good things for a lot of artists as far as visibility. But think of it like like Jevsky, right? You can download. I mean, you can like everything of, of Jevsky is in the public domain. You can go on IMSLP and it's all there and he chooses to do that. But that doesn't mean like everybody's music should be in the public domain because Casey's got bills to pay, you know? I do have bills to pay. The podcast. Robin's got to go to college. Yeah. <laughs> kid need, yeah. Kid needs shoes. Podcast has to has to has to live on. I think the best argument I've ever heard from that time. I think it's all, of course, pretty different now. But back when it was like a real debate, was okay. Like if this is illegal, then I want the record companies to reimburse me for the ninety percent of songs on all the CDs I bought. That totally sucked. Like I bought this. I bought the CD for the hit. And like, and I had to put up with all these other songs that sucked. It's like Napster, people download the couple of songs they wanted and like, you know, generally ignored everything else. I don't know. It's, it's, it's complicated, of course, but it's, it's interesting how like we're dealing with a new thing now. It's like, 
JMU, we can't post certain uh, performances because they get flagged as the Berlin Phil. It's like, well, I, I mean, that's I, a compliment. I, right. Well, <laughs> and it's like, well, thank you. That's great. I know. I, th I think we sounded pretty good, too, but they're still figuring that out. It's like it took the same thing had happened with MP3s. Like it was just like free reign for so long. And of course, there was like all the other sites that followed Napster, like LimeWire and Kazaa and Audio Galaxy. I mean, it was just like this this open season on all that stuff so it, it seems like it was kind of like that with um um or, or or it's still settling like well wait we got to get to a point where jmu can post our recordings and not get confused for the berlin phil like that's we got to figure that out I, just, I think to me what's funny about this whole thing is like this is the sort of thing that like i don't know stuffy lawyers would go to court over not like this like heavy metal band, like stick it to the man and like, no, we're going to go fight copyright. No. <laughs> no. But yeah. And then I, I was thinking Lars, dude, Lars, uh, there have been Lars, like, just come on the podcast, Lars, and tell us. We'll talk about it. Yeah. Well, yeah. We'll talk about it. And then, uh, yeah, but there have been, there. there have been one or two other iterations, as far as I can tell of Napster since Napster, as I talked about, but it was simply the name that it's just someone bought the copyright ironically to their name after they went bankrupt and used it to start some sort of streaming music service. So Napster, the original, is definitely long dead at this point. I thought it was really interesting that the the thing that kicked all this off was just invention of the MP3. It's, and all that is is a compressed audio format that like doesn't degrade in quality. You know, I mean, or it, like ever so slightly. It's like, and then what, Brian? What, did that bother you that I said degrade in quality? No, and you were just like, it doesn't degrade in quality. I was like, ah, there's a lot of people. But then you you, you, you caught it. You're fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. No, come on. No, it's like, it's like what? You can hear minute little differences, you know? It's like, and it, it's acceptable, you know? Ag agreed. I think it is, ex it is totally ac acceptable. Yes. But it's interesting now, like with higher bandwidth and everything, if... Like you could still do all that without it being MP3s, and so it's it's funny. Like because of limitations back then, you needed MP3 to make it even transferable, and so I know it's funny. If we had higher bandwidth back then, we probably could have, yeah, done that without it. Anyway, Diana, how's it going? Are you enjoying the podcast so far? Oh, absolutely. I this is the part. This is this is the part of the podcast Ksenia hates. She says we got to get to the guest. The poor guest is just sitting there. Look at her. Yeah, she's so just a ball of anxious anxiety. Well, you all, our guest is Dr. Diana Loomer, and I just want to tell you a little bit about her. She's a music educator. She teaches and performs in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, in addition to her private teaching, she's also the director of, I love this name, the Steely Pan Steel Band. So you'll never guess what that's a cover band of. Again, that's called the Steely Pan. That's great. Uh, Appalachian State University. And she's a percussion instructor at ASU and Western Carolina University. And the thing that really caught um, caught my, my attention of her is this really cool thing called the Melodic Timpani Project. And so you go online, there's just these wonderful videos of her uh, uh, just playing these really, really good timpani playing, lots of pedaling, lots of melodic timpani playing. So um, I guess, yeah, welcome. And I wonder if you'd tell us a little about the Melodic Timpani Project. Hi, thank you. Um, so the Melodic Timpani Project basically came from I, I was looking for pieces to play when I was in undergrad and actually really um, after I finished marching drum corps when I aged out because we have a lot of timpani melodies in that activity and timpani pedaling in that activity as Brian Nosny knows. He was actually one of my techs at Boston Crusaders so I'm glad that he's here today. But um, after I aged out of drum corps, I couldn't really find other pieces to play. Around that time I was looking for a senior recital rep when I was actually a student at App State, where I teach now. And um, the only thing that I could find was Planet Damnation by John Sothis, which is actually what we played in our show at Boston Crusaders um, my first year marching. And so I love that piece. And it was so much fun to play during the show that I decided to learn it for my senior recital. And that was an amazing ex experience. But once that was over, uh, and it was time to start looking for master's recital repertoire. I really had trouble finding something that was similar to that in style. 
and I was really craving pedaling and I'm not a composer at all. I don't write music and the best that I could do was arrange music. So I started pulling um, pieces together that I thought might be fun to play on timpani and that have some good melodies. So I went for Jupiter from the planets and I actually went through the whole thing and I learned all of the melodies of the entire piece, um, which is a little bit ridiculous. And I know that's not really tasteful. It was just kind of an experiment and it was a lot of fun, but um, my teacher, John Tafoya, called it timpani karaoke, where you just play all these melodies against the backing track. And so that's kind of what I did for my master's recital. And that was fun. You know, I arranged some other things for melodic timpani, but I just couldn't find anything out there that existed. And um, I, I tried writing. I just couldn't do it. So I started asking my friends. And that's sort of how the melodic timpani project came to be, where I just started asking everybody I knew, can you write me a piece? Can you write something for melodic timpani? And that's that's really how it came to be. What kind of fees is like a Brian Nosny level of quality composer charge for that sort of thing? <laughs> well, Brian I Nosny. Paid, I paid her. <laughs> you're, pay, you're paying her? I paid her. I understand. Yep. Yeah. He did write a piece for it and it was amazing. And I played that on my DMA recital. It was so much fun. He gave me the friend discount though. I was, uh, some things connected when you mentioned um, in one of your interviews on your website, you mentioned drum corps and you just mentioned it again. Uh, my friend, his name is Greg Salikas. We went to Rice University together. He was the Blue Knights timpanist for, I don't know, like way too long or whatever, but uh, holy cow, like his timpani pedaling it's just like we did the Bartok Sonata. There you go, Ben. There you go. For Ben, we got it in there. So well, we did how'd the, you do the crashes? I know. Let's let's cover that real quick. Uh, yeah, but, they're but, off. yeah, Greg played the timpani part. I played the percussion part then. I've since played the timpani part and I think just like, wow, the pedaling is really difficult for me. But it, like it was nothing for him. I mean, he just found that all very intuitive and very easy and he he talked about timpani playing very much the way you demonstrate it in your melodic timpani kind of explanation video and i love the like the the floor cam where you can see all your feet and and i mean it's just is that pretty common in drum corps like timpani parts like that yeah it's very common i would say as far as um timpani in drum corps setting we sort of act as the bass voice of the front ensemble and so i mean you've got you know sometimes five octave marimbas, but otherwise, oh, and I guess now synthesizers too, since electronics are involved. But before all that really came to be, timpani was sort of the only option there was for a bass voice. And I think that might be, at least that's what it seems like to me, that's kind of where this came from. Um, and so in the drum core activity, a lot of times you end up doubling parts, maybe from the brass instruments. So I remember playing a lot of tuba parts, um, or just whatever sounded fun. I was really lucky because I instruct, I had instructors who encouraged me to be creative. And so sometimes I would hear something in the brass parts and think, wow, I think that would sound really good on timpani. Can I try it? And then they would say, sure, let's see if it works. And if it did, then it was in. I think also like this whole melodic timpani thing, it brings to mind, we had Sean LaFriends on the podcast from Pearl Adams a, a couple months ago. And he said his teacher told him, you'll never get good at something if you don't practice it. And I think students can be so afraid of playing timpani out of tune that it's like, I'm going to tune, I'm going to check with the tuner, and once I've got my C, E flat, and F, I'm not touching it. And they'll practice timpani for 45 minutes straight, if, if the, we're lucky as teachers, <laughs> uh, and they, they won't move the pedals at all. And it's like, that's, that's like... The timpani music generally on the hands is not all that hard. It's, I mean, yeah, like you've got to get a good tone and all, but most of the etudes we play, not that difficult in terms of just getting the notes out. So yeah, tuning is just so unpracticed, I find. I completely agree with that. And that I think is a big part of the reason why um, this hasn't really bloomed very much. Um, just as a concept, because, you know, the mechanics of timpani have improved so much over time, just like, you know, brass instruments, they got valves, and now they're able to play more notes a lot more quickly and easily. Um, so just like other instruments have developed mechanically, and the repertoire and the um, virtuosity has really grown, I don't feel like that has really happened for timpani. And I think it's because of the cycle of fear. And so it's a combination between fear of percussionists being afraid to use their ears and try this new skill and then maybe also a fear of, of composers going too far outside of the box and doing something that um, percussionists don't 
think they should be doing because it seems really difficult and not everyone wants to try it. So I think that's been kind of a cycle. But the way that I think about it, actually, I really don't think it's that hard to do once you try it. And and I, you know, maybe it seems that way because it's something that I do a lot. And so it, it, it seems like, OK, well, you do it. So, of course, you don't think it's hard. But from teaching it to students, too, I can see that once they try it, it's really not that hard. Um, we have ears, percussionists have ears, even though we don't usually have to do tuning other than timpani playing, we have them, most of us. And I think if you can move your foot like this, you can do it, really. it's Physically, it's not that difficult. And if you practice ear training, it's not bad. So the way I think about it is kind of like trombone. You know, if you can, if you can find your slide position, I don't play trombone, I don't know what to do with my hands, but you can find your slide position and it's not like they, they have a set actual physical position or a button that they press or anything. It's you approximate and then once you get there, you use your ear and you adjust. And it's the same thing with like a string bass, you know, you've got four strings, maybe four timpani and each string has a range on it and you put your finger down about where you think the pitch will be. With timpani you put it to about the angle you think it'll be and then you use your ears and adjust and so to me that's the exact same thing as these other instruments and if you can play those instruments why wouldn't you be able to do the same thing on timpani yeah it really makes a lot of sense you know diana when i was reading on your website about the project um, I, I kept having the thought, like, I think so many of us might be afraid to tell composers, like, please give me more notes, like, I can play that bass line, you know, it, it can just open up a whole can of worms. Is there a kind of a set of guidelines that you've given to composers who might not be as familiar with what we're capable of? Um, or, you know, any, any funny or interesting stories about composers taking it too far? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> absolutely. So generally, what I tell composers is, don't write a timpani solo. That's rule number one. When I say, hey, can you write me a piece? Don't write a timpani solo because almost all the time, um, either they have percussion background and they sort of have this idea in mind of what a timpani solo should sound like or look like. Um, but I tell them just completely go away from that. Or if they don't know about timpani, I think that's a good thing. But there seems to be a tendency for them to want to go and do some research about the instruments and see what's out there and what exists. But I keep saying, don't do that. Just write for um, a two octave range from C to C, just as you would for any other instrument. Just play or just write what you want to hear in the timpani voice. And don't worry about the difficulty because I'm going to try it and we'll find out if it's possible or not. And if it's not, OK, cool. But so far, there really hasn't been anything that that somebody has written that has been impossible other than maybe a note or two here or there. And as far as funny stories, yes, absolutely. So um, John Sothis actually wrote a piece, which was a dream come true because he wrote Planet Damnation and that was kind of what started all of this. And so he wrote a piece, it was called Booyan, and it's really, really difficult. I have to look up the number of tuning changes, but I think it's like 360 something maybe in a six minute piece and there's a whole minute in there where there's almost no tuning so it's really kind of within five minutes so it's something like at least one change per second i think is what it comes to be so it's a lot of tuning um but the original version of the piece it was kind of doing the thing where it had a bunch of stationary pitches and he was moving around a lot and there were some changes but i was kind of hoping for more um, so I did ask him if he could maybe add some more melodic material a little bit in the piece. And it's funny because shortly after that conversation of going back and forth, I got to meet him in real life, which was an amazing experience after all these years. He lives in New Zealand, so it's, it's not very often that he's in the States. So I met him and um, I remember eating breakfast and him saying something like, I'm, I'm known for the difficulty of my music and that was the first time a, a musician ever asked me to make a piece harder and I was so embarrassed. <laughs> oh my gosh, it was terrible, but it ended up being amazing and I love the piece. Well, if I can interject that your recording of Planet Damnation, it was one of the few times I've ever turned on a re YouTube recording, started to watch it and just turned it off because I didn't want to feel any worse <laughs> about myself. <laughs> oh no! I just couldn't. <laughs> It's just so amazing, and I just couldn't bear myself to to admit to myself how how bad of a musician I was watching it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about Planet Damnation. Um, it's a really 
I mean, it's a monstrously tricky piece, and I think uh, it probably requires you to have two different approaches based on whether you're going to record it like you did, which you did so beautifully, or you're going to play it live. Do you have any advice for those who are struggling to do it live? <laughs> How should they do it? Um, okay, so I guess I, um, I want to make sure that I understand what you mean as far as the differences, because actually when I recorded it, I didn't know anything back then about what was typical for a recording process. And so what I did was I just played it. I just played it all the way through, I think, three times or something. And then we took maybe big sections that we were happy with or something. But at the time, I, I didn't even know we were doing that. I was just trying to do a run through. So in my mind back then, I was just playing it as if it was just live. But um, do you mind just um, specifying? Sure. So the thing that I've experienced with my student when we put the piece in a big hall is that it is very difficult to find a good balance between the track, the karaoke part, and then the timpani part, which is so, so, so busy, but even with very, very articulate mallets, you either get an underwhelming track so that you can hear the timpani or you get, you know, you, you can't hear one or the other. Um, it's different in a recording because you can tweak all of that and make the balance really beautiful for a set of speakers or headphones. But what do you do when you perform this live? Oh, okay, gotcha. So as far as balance between timpani and the track. Yeah, um, so Sothis is great because he usually he includes multiple versions of the backing track. And so he has a dry mix and a more resonant mix. And so that's really helpful as far as what hall you're playing in. So I think for that one, if I were playing in a resonant hall, I'd probably use the dry mix. Um, that one is also really tricky because the times that I have performed it live in a more resonant hall, I've had to use pretty hard mallets in order to make it sound articulate enough. But to me, that was kind of a bummer because it ended up not sounding as melodic. So the, the hard part is finding mallets that, um, I guess, have enough weight that you can really still hear the tone come through while also being articulate enough that you can hear something with fast rhythms like that in a really wet hall. Well, I had a question, Diana, uh, regarding the sort of practicality of all of this. And I guess many of us here are maybe more marimba-centric players, but you go from a Malatek marimba to a marimba one, and the bars are totally different. Uh, it's it's just it might as well be a different instrument entirely. Timpani. Uh, first of all, I, I kind of put in the chat a few minutes ago. We're making a bold assumption here that the timpani we're playing are in range and in good condition, which is often not the case, and I'm sure often an obstacle for people other than yourself that haven't uh, spent time actually working with timpani. But beyond that. There, I mean, the different manufacturers, granted the sizes are pretty similar, but I would imagine the feel of the pedals can be very different. And that doesn't even address the fact that some pedals are not balanced action pedals. So when you approach this project, did you just sort of automatically assume in mind, like, I'm going to be playing timpani with balanced action pedals? Have you found that Majestic versus Yamaha versus Ludwig timpani respond pretty similarly to these? Or what, what's been your take with that? Yeah, that's a really good point and definitely a, a struggle for melodic timpani playing. Ideally, if you're going to play a piece like this, um, you're probably in a situation where you maybe you're in college and are preparing for a recital, so you should be able to practice on the timpani that you're going to end up performing on. That's not always the case. So I can think of two situations where I've kind of run into trouble with this, and one of them was when I was doing DMA auditions and I auditioned at Stony Brook, and my plan was to do uh, Planet Damnation as one of my excerpts, but they only had Dresden Timpani. So I had to do it on Dresden Timpani, and it still happened. It was possible, but it was scary because I hadn't practiced that ahead of time. <laughs> so every once in a while, you run into something like that. And yes, those especially feel really different because the, you know, the springs only go one direction. I don't know. So, um, and then I, Oh gosh, that piece, I have such a weird history with this piece, but I also had to perform it live. And this is a whole other story that I could tell you that, that would take probably an hour to get through. But the um, gist of it is that I actually performed that with a percussion ensemble. The first time I have ever, well, only time I have ever performed it with actual humans and not just with a track. But um, I found out on my way to go to this performance, which was two hours away, that they were playing the piece, first of all, I didn't even know they were performing this, and also that their soloist was sick and that they needed a sub. 
And so two hours before this performance, I found out that um, they wanted me to be the soloist on the concerto. And I had to borrow clothes and mallets and music and drums I had never played on with a group I had never rehearsed with and just perform this thing with no time to warm up at all. I actually got there a little late. I was going to get to the concert a few minutes late, but they were starting with this piece, so they held the doors. So that's the gist of it. It was absolutely insane, but um, Timpani I had never played on. So on the way there, I asked them to make sure that the drums were in the range that I was used to. And then from there, I just kind of had to feel it out. And that's one of the nice things about doing a lot of this is that you can kind of generally get a sense for um, what timpani feel like. And luckily, they were majestic. That's what I plan. I have a set actually right here. I have a set of majestic timpani in my living room and the um, timpani they had there were majestic. So they're similar, but still every set is going to feel a little different. So the more you do this type of work on multiple sets of timpani, the more you get used to just how timpani act in general. And things like um, toward the top of the range, usually the space between intervals is a little bit wider, so you need to go a little bit further. And then as you go down, the space is a little bit narrower. So a half step isn't going to feel the same um, at different parts of the range of one drum, let alone on different drums or a different set of timpani. So there's a lot to think about, but basically the more you you play on timpani and get to know just the mechanics of the instrument, the easier it's going to be to adjust in a situation like that. Cool. Yeah. Uh, just for our maybe younger viewers that aren't as familiar, most timpani like you see in a high school are what we call balance action, where you just move your ankle up and down. But some timpani actually have a clutch where you have to move your foot outward to unlock the pedal and then it's either ankle action or leg action from there, but you might actually have to lift your entire leg up and down, which is a lot more involved than the ankle thing. Uh, but I just had a, a quick anecdote to share, and that is that several years back, there was a PAS timpani competition. I don't know what year this was, but it was a while ago, I know. Uh, and Bill Mersch was one of the judges for it. And apparently uh, one of the pieces that had been written for this competition was just crazy pedaling everywhere. And Vic Firth was one of the judges and I guess when Mersh first showed up, Vic first said, why are you here? And then a few minutes later, when someone performed that piece, he said, oh, I know why you're here. It's because this is a marimba piece. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Sorry, oh. Ksenia, I think you had something. Yes, I wanted to ask about Diana's and Brian's collaboration. Um, and I'd like to applaud Brian for writing what seems to be the first ballad for timpani solo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's very, very melodic and not one of those muscly, let's go for it pieces. It really expanded the repertoire. If we have Satas on one end, there's Nosny on the other. So can you tell us about that collaboration? Oh my gosh. I, I'll let you talk to us like Brian. Yeah, it's, no, you um, go. <laughs> that was a really fun one. Uh, and for that reason, it's because I, I love Sothis' music and it's really, really fun, but sometimes I do want something that's just sounds beautiful and you just really get to focus on the pitch and the resonance and, you know, the sound of timpani. And so I really um, enjoyed Brian's piece for that reason. And I also love the fact that um, on timpani, sometimes it's hard to play melodically and also feel supported as far as accompaniment. And I think that that piece was really great because you could feel a little bit of both of that. There was melody and accompaniment. And that kind of texture, I think, is a little bit easier to do maybe on keyboard instruments, but it's definitely a challenge on timpani. And I think Brian did a great job of that. I wrote a two mallet marimba solo. I'm not kidding. That's what I did. I, I uncovered my marimba, the bottom two octaves. I grabbed two soft mallets and I started writing and I went, okay, let's just see what happens. And I thought fully the entire time, okay, I'll send this to her and I'll get notes back. This isn't probable. And all of a sudden, like, like two months go by or something. And then I get a text from her saying, first run done. Sounds great. And I'm like, Show, like no no and then and then i got a recording and i was like oh my this is stupid like i and i felt it if you look at the program notes of mine it actually says while written for timpani this piece can be played on any two octave polyphonic instrument because all i could think was i actually it's i am kind of proud of the piece and the, the idea behind it and whatever and all i could think is there's like one diana loomer I don't know that anyone else will play it. There's actually one girl right now in Europe that 
is playing it for a competition and i'm surprised and, and very grateful that maria is, is playing it but i'm like but i'm like no one will play so i'm like all right well at least if i can do that then at least it maybe has a life beyond you know freak of nature timpanists of which there are like 0.0001 percent in the world that could actually play this on timpani so but i was just honored for diana to ask me and and she absolutely killed it it makes me so happy that you wrote that on marimba because that's exactly what um, i was hoping for is that people when i say don't write a timpani solo i really do mean that like don't write a timpani solo and that's exactly what you did you wrote a marimba solo basically but imagining hearing it in the timpani voice so i think that's amazing i wrote a marimba um, solo that i can play so let's go <laughs> with that that that's that's where it gets down to it that's awesome <laughs> and then also um i just want to point out you said that there's another person who's playing it which is amazing because i think you know i sometimes i do get that comment like oh like diana loomer will play this whatever but what i'm realizing is there are a lot of people out there that do this we just don't know about them because we're kind of a small group and we don't usually speak up because usually people think we're crazy when we say we want to play melodies on timpani but there are actually quite a few of us out there and i think people are going to start playing these once they realize that the music exists well, Sorry. and you did such beautiful recordings of them, too, that that's what's going to get exposure to them as well. So, Sorry to be the uh, the Bill Mersh anecdote guy, but there's this other great story about Mersh and Haas were sitting next to each other at PASIC, and uh, Alan Adi was up on stage saying how stupid a career in solo marimba was and how stupid solo marimba was and it would never take off. And Haas was sitting there giving Mersh the elbow. And uh, then finally, Adi says, you know, but the only thing dumber than solo marimba is solo timpani. <laughs> so there are not not too many people that can do it. Um, but Diana, I was going to ask really quickly, obviously, Planet Damnation was a, a pre-existing piece that that you sort of took under your wing. Are there any other pre-existing repertoire from the pre lumer era that you think qualifies as melodic timpani that you really enjoy? uh that's really tough and that's that's really kind of the struggle and that's why this project started because i know that there are pieces out there i know there are some even that i don't know about um there's a piece by stanley leonard called canticle i believe is the name and um that's a good one it's it's very melodic i haven't played it myself but i know that it's out there um there are also quite a few etude books um i think kurt gay pedal to the kettle maybe is one of them. And then Stan Leonard has a book. Alexander There's one Levi called The Tuneful Timpanist, I know. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are no. some things out there that exist. I don't know if there's anything quite as wild that I'm aware of pre-project. Or, Alex, and I'm going to bu butcher his name, but I think Alex Orfale. Yeah, Orfale, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he, he, he writes some really nice melodic timpani stuff. And it pains me because I remember at North Texas, whoever... There was a competition for timpani, I think, for like the PAS competition or what, like the composition content. And I can't for the life of me remember what it was, but I remember hearing one and the guy, whoever this was in the competition, I think it got second place, wrote basically a Bach chorale. That was his goal, like on timpani. And it was beautiful and it was very melodic and stuff. And honestly, that was my idea as I was writing the piece for you. It was like, I want to try and do that thing that I remember. So there are some out there, but they're very few and far between. Right, exactly. Yeah, I'm up. I know that there are some I just remember that I kept wishing there was more and more variety. And so the goal here is just to ex expand the repertoire so that whatever your personal style is of music that you enjoy playing and listening to, that there's something out there for you. So I'm trying to ask as many composers as possible with such a wide variety of backgrounds and styles to um, just give us more repertoire to choose from. I can play Cat Scratch Fever on there. That's kind of Brian and I's speed. Diana plays the freaking uh, Coloss excerpt on timpani. It's crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. That's it's not cool. good, but it's fun. Um, you know, before <laughs> before we make our our, uh, our our next little transition, you know, by the way, I wanted to say real quick, I had the thought that, well, um, it, a while ago we were talking about other instruments and like how, how other instruments have grown so much, can do so much. And like timpani pedaling, it's not like heart pedaling, you know, it's like, heart pedaling, you, pe you pedal one position and a lot of the strings change. You know, it's like timpani pedaling, if you don't know, it's like each drum has a very limited range and every movement on a pedal can change one drum to one other pitch. 
So it's this huge amount of planning of like, okay, well, if this drum is busy on this pitch, I have to play this other pitch on this other drum, even though it's ideally over here. I mean, it's a very uh, choreographed um, thing that Diana is doing, you know, and, and one of the questions I was going to get to eventually is like, why don't you think this has taken off? And I, but I, I almost think it's kind of self-explanatory. It's like, well, it's really hard. You know, it's, it's, it's because it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, I think it, like you say, though, it will take off. People do do this. They do like this. And there is a, a want for it out there, but it's just a, more applause to you. I mean, it's like, it's not like playing the freaking harp. <laughs> it's like, it's not, not that harp's easy, <laughs> but, but it's like, no, this is one pedal movement for one pitch on one drum. Um, anyway, it's, it's, um, yeah, you got, if you haven't seen this, you got to just look up Diana. It's, it's really cool. Let's see. So, Hey, b before we make our next little transition, I have a quick little, uh, game for you guys. This, you guys are going to be really into this. This is called name that tune on, um, but it's on timpani. All right. So this is a famous tune. Uh, okay. It's way funnier on timpani. <laughs> Go to the beginning. Now we're gonna get flagged for Berlin Phil Casey. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna get flagged for Berlin. <laughs> oh All right, name God. that tune. Okay, that that's all. I just had to do that. Sorry. It actually sounds pretty pretty cool. <laughs> sounds like a sounds like a Lars Ulrich drum solo. It sounds like really abstract over there. <laughs> I'm going to be honest, after hearing that, I kind of want to try it. I know it's not going to sound I was, was going to say, like, Diana, have you ever tried it? <laughs> no, I, mean, I haven't tried that one. <laughs> that's like the thing, like, it's like a, everyone wants to play, like, can you do it on organ with your feet? Can you do it on tuba? Like, timpani, why not? Yeah, why not? Yeah, yeah probably a better chance doing it on timpani than organ with feet. I don't know if you guys have ever gone down the stupid rabbit hole that I have, but apparently the Guinness book of world records for fastest guitarist is playing that piece and so you can look this up and it's like people playing it it's just like so fast with like sweet picking and stuff like that that you don't even know what's happening anymore and it's all just being time to try and get into the guinness book of world records i don't know why that became the piece but i don't know fun, fun fact fun fact lee stevens used to play it on marimba with one hand uh-huh 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 <laughs> And speaking of guitar, that reminds me, um, Casey, when you mentioned that with, with timpani, you know, you only have two feet since you only get to change two pedals at a time. That reminds me a lot about, uh, or a lot of Django Reinhardt. You know that the guitarist Django yeah, Reinhardt, two, two he only fingers. had two fingers. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that always seemed really familiar that, you know, like if you think of timpani as a set of strings and each string is a drum, but you can only change up to two pitches at a time. I mean, Django had that same kind of limitation i guess but he was still able to figure it out was it his plucking hand or his fingering hand i don't remember i think it was the the ones on the frets i don't know which one it was his fret hand okay <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 i said that'd be more impressive because i mean but even that it's like you know one motion you can at least get several notes change Right. It's like no one action is one pitch. I mean, yeah, it's That's really, true. really cool. Well, anyway, let's let's move along here. Ksenia, I think you you planned a little something for us. I get to talk to you because we're talking about different approaches to instruments that we know. Um, there was a very interesting article in the New York Times, the title of which is To Express the Sound of a Country's Soul, He Invented New Instruments. And uh, this article reviewed a fascinating exhibition of musical instruments at the America Society. Um, so most composers write music for instruments that already exist, right? And then there are those Wagnerian parch types that create their own sound devices or twist known forms beyond recognition. And one of these people uh, created a series of sculptural surrealist inventions, mostly based on the marimba. You can bow them or saw them or play them by shaking them, etc. And here's how the article starts. It says, in a short story, the Guatemalan composer, inventor, and writer Joaquin Orellana imagines a musician who, dissatisfied with the instruments of Western civilization, much like Diana is dissatisfied with the state of timpani, um, sets out to create the sound of hunger. 
Possessed with a desire to express his people's suffering, he progressively starves himself, then records his altered raving voice. In his delirium, he sees sheet music staves come alive with anguished and violent cries, the sound of hunger. And so, like the protagonist of the story, Oroshana seeks to express the suffering of a country traumatized by genocide and civil war, while largely shunning the materials of Western music. And I thought this was just spectacular. And also, if you're interested in this topic, you should uh, read, I mean, the topic of hunger and art, you should read a short story uh, called The Hunger Artist by Franz Kafka, um, where fasting is elevated to an art form. Really interesting, but that's just a little plug. So a little bit about Oshana. Uh, he was born in 1930 in Guatemala. He's a composer and violinist in Guatemala City. And then at 30 something, he goes to Buenos Aires, which was the place to go in the Americas. And he saw an electronic studio. So this is 1960s. He freaked out, but you know he had to go back because he was there on an exchange program and he realized he still needed those sounds. But besides not having resources back in Guatemala, he also felt alienated from a music scene centered on folkloric traditions expressed through the traditional instrument, which is the marimba. Still, the marimba fascinated him, so he decided to change it up. And many things uh, came uh, from it, which I think is just incredible. Um, he prided the marimba apart and twisted it into new forms, and it reminded him of looping and sequencing. So one of the instruments that I'm going to show is called the imbaluna. And the imbaluna, the word, is a portmanteau, so a combination of marimba, that's imba, and luna, which in Spanish means moon. Um, this is from a little sort of documentary from America Society about him. That's the Embaluna. I think this is just so, so, so fascinating. Um, in any case, so what came first was the gesture, not the shape of the instrument. So if you are watching, um, well, if, if you're listening, you should go watch because I can't really explain. It looks like a marimba and a, a half, like a crescent moon combined, uh, for example, one of these instruments, the imbaluna. But the shape of the instrument didn't come first. It was the gesture. The composer really wanted an instrument to be played a certain way. And then he built the instrument around the physical gesture that he wanted, which is, I think, really incredible. Um, so the notation is really specialized. It's all graphic scores. And he said, this is a low tech solution to an avant-garde desire. There are about 50 to 60 works for these instruments and other standard instrumentation and only very few solo works. And here is now an excerpt of his, um, third symphony, uh, sorry, symphony from the third world, which features a lot of these. If you're listening, I think there's about at least a dozen of percussionists out there playing. Um, and I think when I just listened to the sound, I thought that it reminded me very much of Village Burial with Fire, which also asks of you to create all these micro xylophones and so on. But just a fascinating topic, I thought. Um, so now he has a studio in the basement of the National Theater in Guatemala, and it is a point of pilgrimage for many artists to go get acquainted with his works and inspired. And what he sees um, these artworks as is liberating the musical imagination from preconceived forms, which is exactly what Diana does with timpani, is breaking away from what is expected of you to do 
and turning it into something completely new. And he said, I've come to the conclusion that what I'm trying to do is to liberate sound. So I thought this is uh, really lovely. I'm sorry I didn't include any Microsoft Paint. I'm not as funny as Cangelosi. But I was wondering, what do you all think about this um, invention of instruments? Do you think this is necessary? Yeah, you could have easily drawn all those things on MS Paint there, Ksenia. It wouldn't be that wouldn't have been that hard. No, thanks for sharing this. I thought it was like what a what a cool artist. And I thought um, so much about it being related to hunger. I, I would have loved to know, like if I had known if I had not known that's what this art was started with and what it was about, would I <laughs> would I not see all of his instruments as like body parts? It's like those those circular marimba shapes. It's like it just looks like a spine. Um, mm -hmm. Like there's so there's so many shapes in his art that looks like a, a either a body part or a body in like a position. You know, like there's like a figure leaning forward, or there's something that looks like a big hip bone that he is bowing. And um, I, I don't know if that was intentional or not. Did you happen to see anywhere? Because you you probably dug into this a lot more than any of us. But did you happen to see anything? Was it supposed to be like that? Or am I just seeing, is that what I'm seeing? Um, well, you know, the exhibition was titled The Spine of Music. So I think you're not the only person who's, who's okay. perceived it that way. But I haven't found anything from him stating that this is exactly what, what he wanted. But I guess, you know, the the museum curator thought so. So you're onto something, Kangelos. You got a keen eye. Or maybe I read that and then I forgot and then I, you know, <laughs> Then I thought I, I, it was mine. Maybe. It's probably more, that's probably more likely. <laughs> well, Ksenia, you ask, like, is it necessary, you know, as far as, like, could we create, I guess, just as good or effective sounds on the instruments we already have? And I don't, you know, I don't think that's necessarily the question, but what I do think about this, what strikes me is that it's not just about the sounds, although everything that we just heard in those videos, those sound clips are like, that's really unique. Um, but also there's something like so beautiful about the visual element of these instruments. And then even the names like are, are so poetic, like just so artistically created that I think it's certainly worthwhile um and you know it's it's just so interesting i hadn't heard about this before so i'm glad i'm glad you found this yeah and i think that it's i think that yeah it's absolutely necessary i think that unless we push instruments and music and art forward we're just gonna have the same stuff over and over again you know no we didn't we wouldn't have a five octave marimba if someone didn't decide like oh i wish i had this and if you even look back to Bach and Beethoven, uh, they were, uh, uh, Bach well-tempered clavier, I believe was written for notes that didn't exist on the piano, if I remember right. But his idea was they will eventually have them. So I'm just going to write for it. So I think that anyone that's going to push our art form forward, it might not catch on. Harry Parch, you know, is played by a very small percentage of people, but the fact that it's still out there is beautiful. Yeah, I mean, what Brian's saying is very much in the uh, Mark Applebaum vein of like, we don't do experiments because we know they'll work. We do them to, to find out what happens. Um, but I was going to show, uh, let's see here, where is it? Um, have you guys, did you see this in 2015? Uh, Yamaha did this project where Yamaha obviously makes motorcycles and musical instruments, which there's a really interesting history behind that. The short story is that they made musical instruments when World War II came around. They retooled everything to make, uh, you know, military stuff. And then after that, they retooled that and they could make motorcycles. So that's why they make this kind of weird disparate thing. But anyway, they did this project where they had their instrument designers and motorcycle designers trade places. And so this is a motorcycle designed by the instruments team. Um, and uh, it seems a little unsafe that like the basically you wear a smartwatch that has like your revs or your speedometer on it or something like that. <laughs> I don't know. It seems kind of dangerous to be taking your arm off. And then there's the uh, musical instrument made by the uh, motorcycle team. Uh, and if you're listening, uh, you can just Google this later, I guess. Uh, but here's a little clip of it, it in action.
so obviously not being played uh played live on that oh my recording. god ben it moves <laughs> yeah it's a if anyone's listening uh look this up later it's a basically a marimba that that surrounds you that you sit inside of and it spins it's uh it's pretty cool i, I don't i don't know that musically i could i could play a whole recital on it but it's a very interesting sort of art piece and just like a, it's a stimulating activity, I'm sure, for these designers. If you sit designing pianos all day, like, how how would I design a a motorcycle? Yeah, sure. So, if you wore those clothes they were wearing, you could do a recital. Oh, that's what I wear every time. Yeah, I can't imagine doing it without those yeah misty ethereal clothes. I think this is beautiful. I I mean, I got a little teary eyed because I think it's so aesthetically interesting and pleasing and i i mean i'm just and yes i think playing porgy and that would actually be easy if just a person rotates the marimba around you at a good speed and you have all the bars lined up right all you have to in do order. Is just press. <laughs> <laughs> hold the hold your mallet against the bars and that's it it's amazing wow thanks for sharing that then anyway yeah. i mean kudos to those folks who keep reinventing what we do much like diana uh, included i think it's so beautiful and spectacular and it keeps enriching our craft and art so thank, thank you well and who's to say where this is all gonna go right I mean, if you look at like diana's mentioned john sothis so many times and his you know pieces for tape you know, are and and you know, live performer are amazing. But if we didn't have Pierre Henri and Pierre Schaeffer and music concrete back in the day and stuff, like we would have never gotten to that point. You know, so it's I mean, and they were just doing, hey, I don't hear the sounds that I want to hear. Like let's mess with you know, it's it just all makes it's it's just an evolution. Who's to say where this is going to be fifty years from now? Yeah, I just want to jump in and say also that. I'm definitely not the first person to do this. There have been, for sure, there have been people before me and people that I have looked up to that have done timpani puddling and um, written pieces for it. I just happen to be really vocal about it because I want to have more repertoire for it. But I know I'm not the first and I know there are a lot of other people out there doing it. And I just hope that this concept and this idea keeps growing and that it becomes more popular because it's so much fun and I love it. Well. Diana, probably part of it too is just the generation that you're in, right? Because like Jonathan Haas, right? He kind of was the, like, he was the guy who was trying to be the first like solo timpanist, right? Well, when Jonathan Haas was doing it, he didn't have the internet, let's be honest. Like he didn't have YouTube and stuff like that. So you're just picking up the mantle and using the tools that you have right now at your disposal. So, um, Credit where credit's due, absolutely, but it's also the generation and the tools that you have now that, that help to push this forward that he didn't have or whoever else before didn't have. Very true. So, Diana, we do have a couple of Facebook questions from our listeners, and this one's from Sean McWilliams. And Sean asks, uh, through your work with the Melodic Timpani Project, what has been the biggest takeaway from the music you've had written? Okay, so from the music I've had written, it seems like going through the process, there's there's still hesitation for most composers um, to go outside of the box. It still feels like a little bit of like, I'm, I'm not sure if I should really uh, go full out. But after talking to them and, and convincing them, it usually seems like they're okay with it and they try it and, and it always turns out to be great. So I guess the biggest takeaway is that um, if you're unsure, just try it, because the worst that can happen is somebody can say, mm, that's not going to work. Yeah, nice. I, I think a lot of times you're right. I think composers, maybe when they're in school, they're told, like, be careful with this instrument or don't write ridiculous things for this instrument. And of course, like, that's all justified, too. You know, we want to understand how the instrument works. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I agree with that. There's a, a time and a place for everything, and you shouldn't always write melodic timpani parts. You know, it's it's probably going to be specific to who's going to play it or whatever setting it's meant to be played in. So I don't think that composers should necessarily be writing melodic timpani Tiffany in everything they do, but uh, just to know that it is an option sometimes, depending on the situation. Oh, and sorry, one more thing based on that. Um, I guess I wanted to, to clarify that what I'm talking about right now is melodic timpani, which I consider to be different from timpani pedaling. And a lot of times those kind of 
ideas get interchanged in our minds, but actually I just like hearing timpani in a melodic voice, which might not actually require any pedaling at all, depending on what pitches you're using. I mean, if you think about um, mm -hmm. soloing based on chords versus soloing based on scales, you know, you could play a solo maybe in, in a jazz context or something where you're just using chord tones, but it might not necessarily sound like a very melodic solo unless you start using some non-chord tones and passing tones, that sort of thing. And that's where I really think it, um, that concept translates well when you think of melodic timpani because most of our music is based on a chord or a set of pitches. And what makes it sound more melodic is if you start moving between those pitches and get from one chord to the next, which is where pedaling is usually involved. I thought about that too. I, I noticed as like I was watching some of your videos and the pedaling that you do is so athletic sometimes and that's amazing but then you like the the project isn't called the pedal like crazy move your feet really fast project right it's melodic and that's so important um i we do we do actually have another facebook question from sean mcwilliams he says a second question do you feel that melodic timpani playing has a place in the collegiate curriculum and to what degree yes i think it should absolutely be included it doesn't have to be crazy. I don't think everybody needs to play pieces from this project, but I do think that some basic skills like just playing scales on timpani can be really, really important. First of all, because it's great ear training, um, but also there are a lot of other things that can come from it. Things like coordination. So I've noticed that moving your pedals and having to always be thinking about being articulate with your feet and your pedal motion while also simultaneously being able to play whatever stickings and phrasing and articulation you want from your hands. Those are completely different things. You're, you're really having to separate your upper body and your lower body there. And I think that can be really, really helpful um, translating to things like drum set or multi setups. And then also the kinesthetic awareness that comes from timpani pedaling. You're so hyper aware of the angles of your feet in these little motions that um, you can start being hyper aware of angles and motions like that in your hands or your wrists or your intervals in your mallets and pretty much anything. I think there are a lot of things that come from this, even just something as basic as practicing scales or basic melodies on timpani that can translate to a lot of other percussion instruments. Well, I've seen just great utility. It's like, oh, you want to teach about tuning? You want to teach about pedaling? Okay, learn a melody. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Just come back and learn like one melody. They'll be so much better at at pedaling and tuning just after tackling like one, you know, 16 bar melody, mm -hmm. which I guess is why there are those books like the Tuneful Timpanist. And, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, no. Sorry, did I steamroll? What, what is well, it? A little bit. Diana, oh, we, had a, we had a question. Well, I don't think from, we've had one yet. So we had a question from Hal Rosenfeld, and I wanted to, to tack on, make it even more complicated. But Hal's question is. Does Dr. Loomer prefer to pedal more when passages get more complex slash chromatic versus using more drums? Also, tips for mapping out pedal changes when having minimal slash no time to look at the piece or sight reading a piece. And Diana, I wanted to tack on to that. Uh, I played a couple years ago Michael Doherty's Raise the Roof, which is by far the hardest thing I've ever played on timpani. And I did my research and I saw that some people use like 20 timpani at the front of the stage. And I decided to not do that partially because we just didn't own that many timpani here. But also I thought that it was kind of a beautiful art form to, to actually be able to play the piece on just one set of five drums, you know, one size each. Um, so in your opinion, do you think that the art of timpani playing in a sense should be limited to five drums? And it brings up that, uh, what is that old, old piece for, I can't remember the name of it, the, I think it's Dershetsky, like Symphony for Eight Obligato Timpani where people use eight timpani, but you could probably pedal it on fewer. So rambling question, but that's what I wanted to ask. Yeah, that's a great question. And that's that's one of my favorite things about being able to, to do timpani pedaling is that a lot of times you don't need as many drums. I think most of the time it's not necessary to use more than five. And a lot of times it's not even really necessary to use more than four, unless your range happens to go above that high A. Um, so I would say it really does depend on the piece and um, I guess rhythmically what's going on. So if you have enough time between notes where it makes sense to pedal and you can do that cleanly, then I would say that um, it's most important to put the pitches on the drum that they want to be on. So every pitch usually has kind of a, a, a preferred drum as far as its sound. Because typically you want to put 
pitches in the mid to upper range if you're playing melodic timpani because that's where the pitches sound the clearest and so i i usually say my rule of thumb is um if you have a choice between multiple drums choose the bigger one because it'll put them in the mid to upper range that that'll change kind of depending on the articulation and the sound you're going for sometimes you want a little bit lower softer mellower sound but in general for timpani pedaling when pitch is the priority it's, it's mid to upper range so um in that case, it usually ends up being that I typically move toward the lower drums and I, I'll try to, to pedal if there's time to because I want them to be on the drum where the pitches sound the best. But if you have something like it doesn't make sense to go when, when you're not really going to clearly hear the pitches anyway, you're mostly listening to articulation in that moment, then I think it makes a little more sense to spread them out. And then what about the bit between, he said like when you're sight reading, how do you make quick decisions? Ah, yeah. Okay, so um, my best advice for that, first of all, if, if you practice your skills and you're comfortable with pedaling, pedaling in general, you're gonna be in better shape for a situation like that. But as far as figuring out the mapping of the pitches, um, there's a concept called grouping that I like to use. And um, that basically just means that you sort of assign a certain set of pitches to each drum. So if you know that you have G, A, C, D, E, F, something like that. 32 gets G, A, 29 gets C, D, 26 gets E, F. And so you always know every time you have one of those pitches, you kind of have a go-to as far as what drum you'll put them on. So grouping is really helpful for that, just being aware of which pitches go on which drum most of the time. And you don't have to be limited to that because occasionally things will work out logistically in a way where one of those pitches will go on a different drum. But I think grouping is probably my best advice for having to do something quickly. Well, cool, everybody. I think that's about it. Um, the internet has spoken. It's been over an hour, and the internet doesn't have an hour in them for percussion. Well known fact. So we got to wrap it up. Uh, let's see who. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Carly, tell them to uh, subscribe to the Patreon. Just tell them to do it. Yeah, support us. Support us. Go. Check out go. the Patreon. Tell them to do it, Brian. Su support the thing. Mm hmm. Hey, thanks so much, Diana. It's really great to to meet you. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming on like this. It's cool to, to, to see your work and all the cool stuff you're doing. Thanks for having me. That was fun. Yeah, sure. You're very welcome. All right, Carly, Ksenia, Brian, Ben, take it easy. We'll catch you all in 286. Bye, everybody.